not Russ Moore. I'm Terry Fees, <laughs> the Vice Chancellor for Research. And today um, we are continuing our <coughs> Distinguished Research Lectureship. And it's among the highest honors that faculty at CU Boulder grant upon fellow faculty members. And it's being sponsored by the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research. Over, over the years, academia's greatest have lectured on this stage, including multiple Nobel Prize winners, National Medal of Science winners, prestigious authors, and internationally renowned artists. We currently had three distinguished researchers that we were um, uh, awarding this to this year. We've already seen uh, presentations by Zoya Popovich from the Department of Electrical Computer and Energy Engineering, and also Professor Diane McKnight from the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Architectural <coughs> Engineering. So today we're going to be honored with uh, a lecture by Doug Seals from the Department of Integrative Physiology, and he is joining this very distinguished group that we've had throughout the years. This is the 108th distinguished lecture that we're having. So in order to introduce Doug, I'd like to invite Russ Moore up here to the stage. Thank you, Terry, and we did a little switcheroo from the program. I wanted to, uh, the opportunity to introduce my colleague, my departmental colleague, Doug Seals. So it's both a privilege and a pleasure to introduce him today. If you can read the small font in the program, there's a lot of great accolades that Doug has uh, earned over his career. So I'm not going to try to read a bunch of that back to you. Uh, you can get out your reading glasses and you can read, read what's in there. But I do want to point out some highlights here. Um, Doug came to the University of Colorado in 1992. And he came to a department that at the time <coughs> really wasn't quite, it wasn't very good, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and I came in 1993, and we both had an aspiration to try to build uh, a program that really fit the bill for uh, the University of Colorado at Boulder. And I must say, aside from all of his scholarly accolades, he has done a remarkable job. He's in, in many ways, he's been uh, one of the principal architects for the ascendancy of that program from back then a department of kinesiology to, to today uh, a department of integrated physiology that in the last NRC rankings was named in the top 10 in the United States. So, <laughs> cheer for the program. So not only was, is he a gifted and product, productive scholar, uh, he's been a, a, um, a selfless contributor to the University of Colorado. Um, in 2008, Doug was named as a professor of distinction in the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he won a 10-year uh, NIH Merit Award, which is reserved for only the very uh, most meritorious people to receive funding. His publications have had an impact not only nationally but internationally. If you talk about adaptations to aging and exercise anywhere in the world, the first name that comes up is Doug Seals. Another interesting feature that may, many of you don't know about, or you may not know about, is uh, Doug was the founder of an NIH clinical translation re research center here in the University of Colorado at Boulder. So this is an NIH-funded facility that allows us to do human interventional research, and this is the only one in the United States of, a, of more than 60 that's on a non-medical school campus. So this is right quite a feather in the cap for the University of Colorado Boulder campus, and uh, again, we owe great thanks to Doug for that. Uh, as you can see in your program, he's contributed uh, broadly. He helped form a responsible conduct research program. And uh, aside from his accolades in the research arena, Doug is also an incredible teacher. <coughs> so he's published in pedagogical journals. Uh, he's been, uh, he, he created some wonderful courses for graduate students and postdoctoral fellows to really promote their training as professionals going into both the academic and non-academic workforces. And I just can't tell you enough about his contributions, not only to the department, but to the university. It's also a privilege to be able to introduce uh, Doug's family here today. So his wife, Cindy, is here. And his two daughters, Maisie and Cindy, are also here in attendance. We're missing one of his daughters, but we, we have most of the family here today. So it's great to see you. Uh, so in any case, I could go on and on, but then Doug wouldn't have time to give his lecture. But please help me welcome Professor Douglas Seals. Well, thank you very much, Russ. Really appreciate it. Um, when we set this date almost a year ago now, I wasn't paying nearly enough attention. 
So here I am, standing up here as the only thing separating most of you from a major holiday happy hour. It's a <laughs> tough spot to be in. I do want to thank you all for carving some time out of your afternoons and uh, coming over here to the Glenn Miller Ballroom for the lecture today. I do appreciate it. Before we get rolling, I'd like to take a few moments and thank a few other parties. First of all, I wouldn't be up here without the actions of two committees, actually. One is the IFI Awards Committee. Uh, Roger Crom, Tom Johnson, Teresa Foley. I want to thank them for putting in all the work on my nomination materials. And also the Lectureship uh, Selection Committee, who I knew uh, made some tough choices, and I do appreciate their vote of confidence. A big thanks to my colleague, uh, Dr. Tom LaRocca from IFI, for lending his considerable skills and talents to working with me on the lecture, and also to Megan Leahy, a student in our ATLAS program on campus for her technical contributions. As Russ said, my family's here today, and I do want to thank them all for coming. And I want to especially uh, thank my wife Cindy here for everything she's taken on in the last 30 years so that I could pursue the things that we're going to talk about. I'm very grateful to her. I also want to thank my lab. Uh, the, the group here, shown here in the photo, is the most recent version of the lab. And I want to thank them for all their dedication and their hard work in actually doing the, the research that we're going to talk about today, but really all the generations of the laboratory, which is in its 30th year of operations. Uh, that's a hard thing to accomplish these days. And finally, I want to thank uh, all of my colleagues in the Department of Integrative Physiology, the faculty, and the wonderful staff in IFI, not only for creating such a terrific academic environment to work in, but quite honestly, for putting up with me in faculty meetings for the last 24 years. So let's talk about aging now. As you may have heard, when it comes to aging, we have a major problem, certainly a great challenge. Aging has been described as a ticking time bomb and one of the most important problems of our time. A problem on the same scale as global warming and the other great challenges that face societies throughout the world today. On the other hand, aging can be considered a great victory for society, for medicine, for health care, and has also been described as a crowning achievement of humanity. Now, whether you view aging as a great problem or a major victory, the story really begins with a transformative change in the age composition of developed nations. As a result of improvements in public health, including vaccinations, better nutrition, water quality and safety, advances in medicine, and increases in socioeconomic status, life expectancy has been on the rise. In the U.S., for example, in 1900, the average life expectancy was 47 years of age. It's now 79 years of age and continuing to rise. Now, when we consider this in the context of recent declines in and now stable low birth rates, what you get is a progressive increase in the percentage of the population over the age of 65 which is projected to reach over 20% by the middle of this century. That's more than one out of every five individuals. Now, when you also consider overall population growth, here's what you get, a marked increase in the absolute numbers of older adults. In 1900, there were 4 million adults over the age of 65 in the U.S. Today, there are 43 million. And by the middle of this century, we're estimated to have 89 million people above that age. This is also happening, of course, right here in Colorado. On the left here is a county map of the state. And I put a star here in Boulder County in case your county geography is as bad as mine. And what we did was we colored in all of the counties that presently have over 15% of their population age 65 and older. Here's what Colorado is going to look like in less than 25 years from now, when there'll be a million and a half people over the age of 65. 
Now, one major impact of this rapid population aging and what receives a lot of discussion publicly relates to the leading causes of illness and death. Early last century, the leading causes were infectious diseases, malnutrition, accidents. Now it's these so-called chronic diseases that you've come to learn so much about. These diseases really represent the bulk of our healthcare burden today in the US and in Colorado. And there's only one factor that drives each and every one of these disorders, and it dwarfs all other so-called risk factors, and that's simply advancing age. So as a result of population aging, the prevalence rates of all of these chronic diseases are going to increase dramatically in the coming decades, as will the associated disability. To make matters worse, we're living long enough not to develop just one of these chronic disorders, but actually several of these disorders at the same time. And this is referred to as the comorbidities of aging. So when you consider this in the context of rapid population aging, you can imagine the implications for our society, including changes in caregiving, our healthcare infrastructure, and of course, what you hear a lot about, entitlement programs. So as you might guess, this has led to considerable consternation among certain sectors of government, medicine, and aging policy. And it leads us to the obvious question, which is, what's the plan? What's the plan for dealing with rapid population aging? And the answer is, there is no plan. We're woefully unprepared for what's coming. And this leaves us searching for solutions. One of the solutions that's been broadly advanced as an initiative is to increase health span. What's health span? Well, we know what lifespan is, correct? And for purposes of this discussion, we can crudely divide lifespan up into two phases. One we can call a phase of relatively healthy aging, shown here in the green. This is a phase in which our health remains fairly stable. We're able to do most things that we want to do, albeit not quite as well as when we were younger adults. And this is followed by a period where we begin to develop these chronic diseases, and frailty and disability. Health span is this initial period of healthy aging. Now, as we just mentioned, over the last century, we've become wildly successful at living longer but we're living longer because we can live longer with these chronic diseases and disability. Health span hasn't changed. Our current profile for health span will not be sustainable in the face of rapid population aging. It's not going to work. With increases in the number of older adults, we're going to incur serious consequences if this is the health span profile that we maintain going forward. Further. So what we need to be able to do is to increase this period of healthy aging or health span. And by so doing, we'll also compress this period of time that we're having chronic disease and disability. And I've suggested that this latter profile can be termed optimal longevity, living long but living most of our lives in a state of wellness. Health span, as you can imagine, is a multi-dimensional concept, and it's certainly much more than simply the absence of clinical disease. One of the very important dimensions of health span is physiological function. Physiological function and maintaining function as we go through the aging process is a critical permissive factor in us being able to move from our current health span profile to something that looks more like optimal longevity. And this also means that impairments in physiological function represent a key obstacle to us being to achieve this more favorable health span profile. What exactly is physiological function? Well, physiology is the study of the function of the body, just as anatomy is the study of the structure of the body. For example, as you're sitting there listening to this lecture today, you may have had a late lunch or a snack before coming over here. 
your food has been digested by now and nutrients are being taken up from your intestines and your bloodstream and forwarded to the heart. Your lungs are inflating and deflating, bringing in oxygenated air from the atmosphere. The oxygen is being exchanged by the lungs into the bloodstream and carbon dioxide is being removed. Your heart is pumping this blood with nutrients and oxygen into your arteries. And your arteries are transporting the oxygen and nutrients to all the cells and tissues of your body. And at the cells and the tissues, the cells are bringing in the oxygen and the nutrients and creating energy that can support all the work of the body. Well, what then is integrative physiology? Integrative physiology can be viewed as how all of these physiological functions and thousands of others interact and are controlled by the body to keep us in a state of life and wellness. Not just as we're sitting here comfortably in the ballroom, but when we're forced to interact with our environment, when we need to move or exercise, when we deal with stress or have to encounter warm ambient conditions. Actually, sleep is one of the best examples of integrative physiology. Now, as we age, these physiological functions, many of them begin to decline, as shown here. And this represents a major threat to us maintaining our health span and to the population being able to maintain health span. So from the physiologist's perspective, what we see is declining physiological function with aging in the face of rapid population aging. And the concern is that this could well lead to a perfect storm of physiological dysfunction, activity limitations, and disability. So the goal becomes then to optimize function throughout the lifespan. And this will require us from going from this type of function decline as a population with aging and our current health span profile to something that looks more like this, where we're able to maintain our physiological function for most of our life and really confine serious reductions in functions to this very end of life. And this will support a health span profile that is more representative of this idea of optimal longevity. Now to accomplish this, we must be able to establish effective function preserving strategies. And these strategies should be based on scientific evidence from well controlled research studies. This has really been a major focus of our laboratory for the last quarter of a century. When we began, we knew we couldn't test promising strategies against all physiological functions. Again, there are thousands of functions. No laboratory can do that. So we had to decide on one domain of function to test these strategies against, and we decided to use artery function. This was a good decision for a couple of reasons. One, it turns out that your artery function is an excellent marker of your overall physiological status as you age, including your physical and your cognitive function. Secondly, we now know that when, as we develop arterial dysfunction with aging, it increases our risk of all of these various common disorders of advancing age. So this is something we really want to try to prevent. Now, there are two different kinds of artery function that develop with advancing age and that contribute to all these common disorders of aging. One is an increase in the stiffness of your arteries. The stiffening of your arteries that occurs with aging is in what are called the large elastic arteries, the aorta and the carotid arteries. And as the name implies, these arteries are really designed to accept the blood that's pumped out of your heart with each beat, expanding to do so, and then using their elasticity these arteries recoil to create what we call the kinetic energy necessary to drive blood flow down to all the tissues and cells of your body. When we're young, these arteries are very elastic, and so they expand and recoil quite robustly. But as we age, these arteries begin to stiffen. They lose their elasticity and their ability to expand and recoil. And this causes a whole host of problems. One thing is that it increases our blood pressure increases our risk of developing hypertension. Another major effect is that it increases what we call the pulsatility of our blood flow. And this increase in pulsatility is transmitted to
to all of the cells and tissues of our body, and it particularly is damaging to what we call vital organs. For example, this is the reason why large elastic artery stiffening with age is tightly correlated with loss of cognitive function. Now, the second type of change that occurs to arteries as they age and contribute to these disorders is that arteries lose a bit of their ability to dilate or widen in response to stimulation. This is important for a number of settings in our normal day in which we need to increase blood flow to certain areas of the body. For example, we need to increase blood flow to the brain to support cognitive function to our active skeletal muscles when we exercise, to our gastrointestinal tract sorry, when we eat a meal and, and we need blood flow to support our digestive processes. There are many different ways we can assess artery function. I thought that you might be interested in one way that we do this in people. We can actually image the brachial artery in your arm above the crease in your elbow here with an ultrasound machine, and we can capture those images, and we can compare young and older adults. We can mark the interior part of the artery where the, actually the blood flows, shown here in these red brackets. And then we can stimulate these arteries to dilate. And as you'll see, the artery of the older adult dilates or widens less upon stimulation than the artery from the young adult. Here's the experiment right here. There you go. So these are the two functions that we've really focused on um, in the laboratory. And over the years, we've been able to develop a very unique, what's called translational research approach to studying the efficacy of potential function-preserving strategies on arteries as we age. This means that depending upon the initial amount of evidence that we have to work with, we might test a potential strategy first on cells and mice. And then if we see promising results, we then translate these observations to studies in people. Our ability to study uh, humans in these research investigations, as Russ Moore commented on, was greatly aided in the late 90s when we were able to establish that clinical research center that Russ referred to on the campus, which is in the Wardenburg Health Center. And now, our laboratory and many other laboratories on this campus can perform very sophisticated physiological research on people and do it very safely with the great clinical staff over at the CRC. Well, when we began this work in the early to mid-90s, we had to start somewhere. and We decided to start by studying what are now considered healthy lifestyle strategies. The reason why we did this is that even at that time, there was good evidence that healthy lifestyle strategies, particularly physical activity and consuming a healthy diet, reduced the risk of all of these common age-associated conditions. And we hypothesized that at least part of these benefits were due to the influence of healthy lifestyle practices in preventing artery dysfunction with advancing age. So we set out to test this hypothesis. First studies we performed were on regular aerobic exercise. And what we found in the initial investigation was that older adults who were healthy but didn't exercise demonstrated about half of the artery function that you see in young adults. But when we brought in older adults who exercise regularly, they demonstrated artery function closer to what we see in young adults than to their sedentary peers. We then took a group of older adults who had not been exercising and asked them to walk almost every day for 10 or 12 weeks. And we found that we could restore their artery function to levels that are nearly the same as young adults. Over the years, we performed several more studies on exercise. And one of the remarkable characteristics of aerobic exercise is that it exerts a direct protective effect on your arteries as you age. What I mean by that is it actually shields your arteries from a variety of adverse factors that your arteries are exposed to as you go through your lifetime, all of those factors shown here. For example, we can study the effects of two so-called conventional risk factors for cardiometabolic diseases, elevated LDL, or bad cholesterol, 
and also elevated fasting blood glucose, which is a prediabetes state. And we can see how this affects the aging of arteries. And what we find is that older adults who don't have these risk factors still demonstrate impaired artery function compared with young adults, no real surprise there. But older adults who have either of these risk factors demonstrate even further impairments in their artery function. However, when we bring in older adults who have these risk factors but who exercise, they have completely preserved artery function. Now we can study this throughout an entire lifetime <clears throat> if we go to our mouse model. And that's because mice only live two to three years. These are results of recent experiments. And we took one group of mice and we studied them throughout their lifetime while they ate a healthy diet, a healthy mouse chow diet. So low fat, low sugar diet. And they, in old age, demonstrated some decline in their artery function compared with young mice. Then we took another group of mice and we fed them a so-called Western diet. That means a high fat, high sugar diet but a diet that most people in the US actually eat. And they showed a further impairment in their artery function in old age. However, then we took a group of mice and we studied them throughout their lifetime when they ate a Western diet, a bad diet, but we allowed them access to running wheels in their cage so they could exercise every day and they demonstrated completely preserved artery function despite aging and despite eating this very bad Western diet their whole life. So these are examples of the power and the protective effects of aerobic exercise on aging arteries. Of course, dietary influences also play a major role in healthy lifestyle practices, and we've studied several features of this. One component of eating a healthy diet, of course, is simply the amount of food that we take in per day. Studies have shown for over 50 years that if you reduce the amount of food about 20 to 40 percent below what several different types of animal species would normally eat, you extend their lifespan. They live longer. So we wanted to determine if this had an effect on aging arteries. And so we performed experiments in which we allowed one group of mice to age while they ate whatever they wanted to eat, so as much food as they wanted to eat. Then we took another group of mice and we had them eat 25% below what they would prefer to eat. And at old age, their artery function was very well maintained. Then we took a group of older mice who had been eating all they wanted their whole life and who already had impaired artery function. And we slowly reduced their food intake to about 25% below what they would prefer to eat. And we held it there for about eight to 10 weeks and we completely restored their artery function. So the amount of food that we take in per day has a very powerful effect on how our arteries age. We were able to use these observations in mice to translate to studies in human subjects. So in our clinical research center, we brought in a group of middle-aged and older adults who were overweight or obese, and at the beginning, they had very poor artery function. We then had them reduce their food intake by about 30%, and we held it there for 12 weeks. They lost about 10% of their body weight, but remarkably improved their artery function by about 30%, restoring it very close to levels that we see in young adults. So what we saw here in mice, we saw also in humans. Of course, diet composition is a very important element of eating a healthy diet, and we've studied several aspects of diet composition also. One that I'll mention briefly here is the influence of dietary sodium intake. You may or may not know that current dietary guidelines suggest that we take in somewhere between 1,500 and 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day, depending on the organization issuing the guidelines. You won't be surprised that the average adult in the US takes in much more sodium than this in their diet. So what we did was, in three separate studies, we brought middle-aged and older adults into the clinical research center, and we had them reduce their sodium intake by about 50%, so they would fall between these guidelines. And what we found was within one to two weeks of starting them on a low-sodium diet, 
we reduced their blood pressure substantially and they underwent remarkable improvements in their artery function. So the amount of sodium that we take in in the diet throughout our lifetime really does influence how our arteries age. One of the limitations of all of these lifestyle studies is that most middle-aged and older adults in the U.S do not currently comply with guidelines for physical activity and consuming a healthy diet. And there are a variety of reasons for doing this. When I gave this talk or talks like this over the years, physicians would come up to me after I presented and they would say, what else do you have for me? And what the physicians meant by that was what evidence-based alternative strategies do you have to offer me because my patients won't do this. And we had none to offer. So after hearing this for a few years, I decided that we needed to devote a portion at least of our future research portfolio to creating, again, evidence-based alternative or you can view them as complementary strategies to healthy lifestyle practices. And this is what we set out to do. But we were back at square one, where do we begin? And after we thought about it for a while and discussed it, we decided that we were going to look at the very healthy lifestyle practices that we had already been studying to look for clues. Specifically, what we, what we reasoned was that we knew that healthy lifestyle practices, physical activity and consuming a healthy diet, preserved artery function with aging. So what we decided was to try to identify the cellular and molecular mechanisms or processes that were being changed by healthy lifestyle practices in the arteries themselves. And by knowing how healthy lifestyle practices preserve function with aging, we could draw clues and identify possible alternative strategies. So this is what we did. Over the years, we were able to systematically identify uh, numerous mechanisms that we believe explain much of the beneficial effects of healthy lifestyle practices on artery function with age. I've shown five of them here, and I'll just quickly review them. One of the ways that healthy lifestyle practices preserve your artery function with age is by reducing or, or preventing oxidative stress from developing in your arteries. This is a state that develops because the cells in the arteries produce excessive amounts of molecules called reactive oxygen species. And many of those reactive oxygen species are actually produced by organelles in our artery cells as we age, and those organelles are called mitochondria. So this is a major source of these excessive production of reactive oxygen species. Another mechanism by which exercise and healthy diet preserves artery function with age is by preventing or reducing the inflammation that builds up in our artery cells as we age. And a third mechanism is to increase the bioavailability or concentrations of a very important gaseous signaling molecule in our artery cells called nitric oxide. A fourth mechanism that we identified was that exercise and healthy diet improves cell repair pathways in, the cell, in our artery cells. And this means that arteries are better able to rid themselves of damaged components. And this is a major problem with aging, but exercise and healthy diet improve that. And finally, the fifth mechanism that we have studied and I'll mention here is that exercise and particularly going on a diet, reducing our daily food intake, activates what are called energy sensing pathways in our artery cells. These are pathways that monitor the amount of energy in our cells and inform the other parts of the cell. And both exercise and going on a healthy and going on a diet activate these pathways. So these different mechanisms and others then became what we call therapeutic targets. And the next step was really to identify alternative strategies that would hit these targets. So we developed a set of what we call healthy lifestyle mimicking strategies. Now, most of these strategies that we've studied to date are pharmacologically based, but in most cases we've been able to use natural food-derived compounds called nutraceuticals. So much of what I'll tell you 
come from nutraceutical studies. Over the last 10 years, we've been able to systematically look at various compounds that hit one or more of these targets. And we perform these studies in mice and also in people. A couple of the studies in human volunteers are ongoing now. And what we found is, for example, that a variety of nutraceuticals that reduce oxidative stress as well as inflammation in our arteries as, as we age, including curcumin and curry spice, preserve artery function with advancing age. We've also identified a unique antioxidant compound that makes its way into the cells of our arteries and actually into those mitochondria that produce a lot of reactive oxygen species and neutralize the production of those molecules. And this antioxidant also restores artery function with aging. Nutraceuticals that boost our body's levels of this gaseous signaling molecule, nitric oxide, also we've found improves artery function with aging, as do two different nutraceuticals that activate these cellular uh, repair pathways. One found naturally high in grapefruit, the other in high concentrations in mushrooms. And finally, recent experiments in our laboratory have identified two different nutraceuticals that stimulate these energy sensing pathways. Again, they mimic the effects of going on a chronic diet, both of which preserve artery function with advancing age. One of the limitations of all of these nutraceutical or pharmacological approaches, of course, is that many of them activate only one or two of these pathways, whereas physical activity and eating a healthy diet activate all of these pathways. So to try to mimic the sort of holistic effects of healthy lifestyle behaviors, one idea would be to take all of these nutraceuticals and combine them into what we might call a natural polypill for healthy aging, and this is something that is on our to-do list. One of the new directions in the laboratory is to see if we can mimic these healthy lifestyle practices with behaviors instead of using pharmacological compounds. And a great example of this is the emerging area of intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is designed to mimic the effects of reducing our daily food intake, that is, going on a diet. There are several different approaches to intermittent fasting. You may or may not have seen one or more of these popular press books in the bookstore. We're particularly interested in this one on the right called time-restricted feeding. Now, there's no research yet on time-restricted feeding, but the general idea is to allow people to eat as much as they want or what they normally eat but confine them to the period of the day that they can actually eat anything. In this example, it's an eight-hour period. And the whole idea here is that we want to increase the period of the day in which we're fasting, because there's good evidence that when we're fasting, we're stimulating these energy-sensing pathways, which again are normally activated when we go on a chronic diet and reduce our daily food intake. We believe that this approach to intermittent fasting will improve artery function, and we currently have a study going on in the laboratory to test that hypothesis. One of the most exciting directions in the laboratory right now involve trying to identify molecules that circulate in our blood, change with advancing age, and influence our physiological function. Now, these experiments are really based on the work of others that have shown that when blood from an older mouse is transfused into a younger mouse, the younger mouse takes on some of the characteristics of the older mouse. And this suggests that there's something circulating in our blood, again, that changes with age and brings on these characteristics of aging. In one of the studies that we have ongoing in this area, we're assessing thousands of small molecules called metabolites. These are molecules that are produced by the natural chemical reactions of the body. And in our re recent experiments, we've been able to characterize these metabolites or profile them. And what you're looking at here are so-called heat maps, which are just colorized expressions 
of the concentrations of all of these metabolites in the blood. And this is the profile of metabolites in a group of late middle age and older adults, and this is from a group of younger adults. You can tell that the metabolite profiles differ in these two groups. And we've been able to identify several different metabolites that change with age and are related to reductions in artery function. We've also been able to take a group of older adults and have them undergo an intervention that improves their artery function. And when we do this, we see a shift in their metabolite profile to something that looks a lot closer to what we see in young adults. Importantly, we've been able to identify more than 100 metabolites that we can assess before giving this intervention that actually predict the amount of improvement in artery function in response to these interventions. And we think these latter observations have important implications for a hot area of medicine called precision medicine. It used to be called personalized medicine and could lead to an area that we might term precision aging. For example, perhaps we can assess metabolite profiles in middle age and use it for a couple of different purposes. One, we can try to match a particular intervention to a particular individual, depending upon their metabolite profile. Another idea, and this is the basis of a study that's ongoing in our laboratory right now, is to assess metabolite function in middle age and then follow people out as they age, serially assessing their physiological function and using the initial metabolite profile to predict who among a group will undergo greater declines in physiological function with aging. And this could help us identify people in middle age that need to um, be more aggressively intervened on and let them know that. You might ask the question, where do these metabolites come from that appear to have such an important role in our physiological function with aging? And one possibility is in the trillions of microorganisms, including bacteria, that inhabit our gut, our intestinal tract. These bacteria also produce metabolites from their own chemical reactions. And these metabolites can make their way into our bloodstream, where they can circulate and interact with the various tissues of our body. In experiments we've performed to date, we've been able to show that aging does indeed change the composition of the bacteria in our gut. And it also changes the concentrations of the metabolites that are produced by those bacteria. Those metabolites can then leak through our intestinal barrier and make their way into our bloodstream where they can again circulate in the blood and affect our tissues and our functions. Now, to prove this, we recently performed experiments. And the first thing we did was we established in an old group of mice that they had impaired artery function compared with young mice. Again, no real surprise there. But then we took a group of old mice, and we treated them for three to four weeks with what we call an antibiotic cocktail. Now, this cocktail is designed to wipe out most of the bacteria inhabiting their intestinal tract, including the bad bacteria that we feel are suppressing their artery function. And when we treated these old mice with this antibiotic cocktail, we completely restored their artery function. And now we think we've identified a particular class of these metabolites. And the next step will be to try to inhibit the production of these metabolites by the gut bacteria to see if we can improve function. And we'll start off by conducting experiments in mice. And then we'll try to translate this to human subjects, trying to identify inhibitors of these metabolites that are naturally high in certain, certain foods. The last new direction that I'll mention, and I'll do this very briefly, is that we've worked very hard now for the last five years to expand our measurements of physiological function. And now we're able to measure function in other domains, including metabolic function, motor function, and also cognitive function. And we can do this in both mice and humans. And this will allow, allow us to gain more insight when we study promising function-preserving strategies in the future.
Well, the science that we're discussing here remains the foundation of the laboratory, of course, as we move forward. That said, we also recognize that ultimately, the results of our preclinical research on cells and mice and our clinical research on people need to be disseminated to the public and the findings of these function preserving strategies actually need to be implemented in the community in order for our research to have a full impact on public health and health span. So a few years ago Tom LaRock and I created a series of public outreach presentations and we've now given these presentations to small groups up and down the Front Range in Western Colorado. And these talks are on not just our research, but what we're talking about more broadly, health span and population aging. And we've done a lot of these. For example, I can tell you anything you want to know about Rotary Club luncheon buffets. <laughs> the, the enchiladas are usually a safe choice, by the way, if you get in that situation. Uh, we've also helped organize and participated in a See You on the Weekend series here on the Boulder campus last spring on healthy aging with several of our colleagues in IFI. Uh, I've given a science on the screen presentation at the Bodecker Theater here in Boulder in which we use the film Cocoon as a vehicle to discuss healthy aging. Uh, Tom and I have spent a lot of time over the last few years developing a website called the Healthy Aging Project and we're focusing this website on the things that we're talking about this afternoon, trying to create information on health span and population aging and preserving physiological function. And right now we're populating the website with what we feel is reliable evidence-based information on many of the things we're discussing here this afternoon. And we think this project is really important because there are a lot of snake oil salesmen out and people do not know who to listen to and who to trust and where to go for information. And we think this website will be a source of information that people can have confidence in. I do believe that demand for all of this information, all kinds of health span promoting solutions and interventions, is going to continue to increase. And it's going to increase for at least a couple of reasons. One are things that we've already talked about. There's going to be more and more pressure for health span promoting solutions because of all these negative consequences of rapid population aging. But there's also a very interesting new and positive influence that's being superimposed on these negative influences. And this is coming from people that are actually undergoing some phase of the aging process themselves. I like to use this term, this is not your grandfather's aging. And what I mean by this is that every source of information that we have suggests that people that are undergoing the aging process today are determined to stay healthy and active and fit and productive as long as they possibly can. Now this is going to also create opportunities because people and organizations are watching this increase in demand. For example, the National Institutes of Health are finally beginning to understand that most of the healthcare burden that they're charged with reducing is actually created by aging. So they're slowly starting to devote more of their research funds, not enough, but some, to address issues related to aging. Academic institutions are also watching and programs, including degree granting programs, are popping up all over the country intending to train the next workforce that's going to have to be in place for us to continue this research and education on health span and population aging. Business, including big business, is definitely watching. Products you know, uh, related to aging and health span promoting products are conservatively estimated to make up a market in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And this is going to continue to increase. So this demand is going to create opportunities in a number of different sectors of our society. Now there are many ways to view aging, of course. Some people view aging strictly 
as a linear passing of time. And honestly, I haven't given those folks much to work with today. What I have tried to do is advance the concept that physiological aging, as depicted by this sequence of events, is to some extent malleable. We do have an influence on slowing the rate of decline in physiological function, delaying the age of onset, minimizing the absolute change that occurs, and even in some cases preventing declines in physiological function. A key factor in accomplishing this remains firmly grounded in healthy lifestyle practices. Physical activity and healthy diet will be important for us to be able to change these health span profiles. And this means it's going to be really important for us to continue to emphasize and advocate for research and education that's aimed at reducing the current barriers for people complying with healthy lifestyle practices. In parallel and in the meantime, we need to continue to exploit our growing understanding of the cellular and molecular mechanisms by which healthy lifestyle practices preserve physiological function and health span with advancing age. And this will help us create some alternative, complementary, evidence-based methods for preserving function and health span. This is, of course, but a small sliver of the overall research that's going on in this broad campaign to increase health span which is really a big tent issue. And it's going to take a village of investigators from different backgrounds with different talents and skills, all working together from a variety of disciplines, including all of those shown here, to work really together in this new field of research that's been termed geroscience. If we're going to be able to create evidence-based best practices, health policies, and clinical guidelines, to promote health span, which brings us to the final point in the lecture today. And that's what's our role in all of this? What's the role of the University of Colorado Boulder in population aging and health span, research and education? If we look at these major problems influencing societies all over the world today, from what we can tell, we're doing a fantastic job on these other major problems that societies face. We've estimated as many as 40 campus-wide programs at this institution addressing these very important problems. In contrast, there's not a single program on this campus related to aging. If we look at our sister institutions, in the Association of American Universities, these are all of our peer institutions, over 60 highly prestigious campuses. There are only two without a single program on aging at the campus-wide level, and that's us and the University of Oregon. Along the front range, the University of Denver and Colorado State University both are establishing new centers for the study of aging, and these are going to be housed in brand new facilities and are associated with what we call faculty cluster hires, hiring groups of faculty to work together to stimulate work in this area, this area of aging. So maybe it's at least time that we have a conversation about establishing a program on aging at CU Boulder. There's no question we have the academic scope and the faculty investigative talent and expertise to make significant contributions to population aging and health span related research and education. Okay, it's been suggested that life can be summarized in four bottles. <laughs> and there's no question that this, this has some truth to it. I'd also like to think that Spock had it right when he said live long and prosper. What I'd like to think that Spock meant is to live long, but live most of your life in wellness with good physical and cognitive function, emotional health, and at a high standard and quality of life. 
that is, optimal longevity. There are several people working in the field of aging now that believe that if we can just increase health span by two to three years on a population-wide basis, it could have the greatest influence on public health in history. And with that, I will officially release you to happy hour, and I want to thank you again for all coming to the lecture today. Thank you.